Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Once more. Hallelujah, thine the glory. remind you who you are in Christ Jesus, you never want to forget it. Never think about who you were, think about who you are. You once were lost, now you're found. You once were blind, now you see. You once were not a people, now you are the people of God. You once were dead, and now you're alive. You once were alienated, but you've been reconciled. You once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Beautiful for situation. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion, the city of the great king. That's who you are. God dwells among you. So the people of God have a right to be noisy once in a while. And to let the world know we're glad that God has lifted us up out of a miry pit. And put our feet on a solid rock. And put a new song in our mouth. Even a song of praise to his name. And I really don't care what anyone thinks about it. I am glad tonight I'm in Christ. The blood of Christ. My subject tonight is we enter into the holiest by the blood of Christ. The holiest, I say. We enter into the holiest by the blood of Christ. We do not spectate the holiest. We enter into the holiest. By the blood of Christ. We do not come to the sub-holy. We come to the holiest. By the blood of Christ. Having therefore boldness to enter into the holiest. By the blood of Christ. By a new and a living way. Which he has consecrated through his flesh. They had the veil. That is to say his flesh. Let us come near. With a true heart and full assurance of faith. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. And our bodies washed with pure water. Amen. The new covenant is a covenant of approach to God. That's what it's all about, coming to God. If you don't come to God, it doesn't make any difference what else you do or what you may, may or may not have done. It doesn't make any difference how big the institution, how much your credentials, how much you may or may not have done. If you do not end up in the presence of God, Christ's death counts zero for you. Amen. That's what it's all about. We do not come to a mountain that can be touched that had thunders and lightnings and quakes and made people afraid. The Lord told Moses, get down there and tell the people not to come near. He told Jesus, tell the people to come near. Tell them to come near now to the holiest place of all. We enter a new and a living way. You see, in the kingdom of God, the focus is the king, not the kingdom. Well, I don't know how that Amen. says with people that preach about the church all the time, but it is something to think about, isn't it? <laughs> because after all, but he that built the house has more honor than the house. Amen. And how do you think the builder feels about us that talking about the house all the time? It's the builder that is the focus Amen. of the kingdom of God. Access to God, that's why Jesus did everything he did. By his death he destroyed him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and delivered them who all their lifetime were subject to bondage to fear of death. Amen. Amen. Moses couldn't do it. Aaron couldn't do it. Samson couldn't do it. The holy prophets couldn't do it. Not even the prodigious miracle workers Elijah and Elisha could do it. Not John the Baptist, the greater never born of woman. Until he came out, he could do it. But Jesus did it. He destroyed the devil. Amen. Now, he destroyed him up here in the heavenlies. That's where he destroyed him. You want to walk there on the earth? Satan is omnipotent down here. He's impotent up here. Amen. And Jesus Christ spoiled principalities and powers. That's what he did. That had ravished humanity and run roughshod over it. 
and he spoiled principalities and powers, triumphing over them in his cross, making a public display of them. Amen. Jesus did it Amen. so we could come to God because these principalities and powers stood between us and God. Satan is the prince of the power of the air. We go right through their terrain to God. Why, at one time in the book of Daniel, an angel took 21 days to get from heaven to earth because he encountered one of these principalities. I can, in a split second, go from here to the throne room of God because they've been spoiled and plundered, entering into the holiest place. Our Lord Jesus Christ appeared once in the end of the world. This is it. We're in the grand wrap-up. Some folk are waiting for something on up there, something from other age. We're in the wrap-up, and once in the end of the world, he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Why did he do it? So we could come to God. That's why he did it. Jesus looked at his disciples. They didn't understand what he was saying at the time, but they did after he went back to heaven. He said, I'm the way. You want to talk about ways, you talk about me. I'm the truth. You want a position? You better think about me. You want a body of something to believe. You want a creed. You want something to get your teeth into, something to hold on to. I'm the truth. Amen. And I'm the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. See, that's what it's all about, coming to God. Amen. You see, there is no religion upon earth, no matter how hoary it is with age or profound in thought, that has ever conceived of its constituents going into the presence of their God. This is unique to us. Not even the Jews with a revealed religion could come into the presence of their God. They could only come in periodically once a year, come into a symbolic presence, so to speak, like to scare them to death when they're dead. But we come into the presence of our God. We enter into the holiest, sometimes there are things upon my heart that I cannot divulge to anyone else, not because I'm ashamed, because I'm incapable of communicating my deep concern for these things. But I can have audience with God. I can come into him and obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And so can you. We enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Peter said that Jesus was suffered in the flesh, but he was quickened by the Spirit that he might bring us to God. What an escort. Bring us to God. Hebrews 2.10 says he's bringing many sons to glory. For once I'm part of a big thing. <laughs> a big thing. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And when you see this assembly on the other side, you're going to see a vast group of people out of every kindred and tribe and nation and tongue and people, and nobody's going to be able to count them. And you will say, the blood did it. They had access to God, to the blood of Christ. Now in our time, we are inundated, have been inundated with what I call outer court religion. See, we're talking about the holiest tonight. Mm -hmm. Outer court religion. Paul called it a form of godliness that denied the power thereof. A lot of talk, nothing gets done. By nothing gets done, I don't mean no apparent success. I mean no one gets close to God. No one becomes more like Christ. That's God's appointed agenda you know he's predestinated that we be conformed to the image of his son he hasn't Amen. switched his agenda and he's not going to Amen. if you're trusting in christ i will tell you now you are going to end up like christ yes. Amen. and you will be like him when you see him for you will see him as he is that's god's agenda Amen. but a religion that doesn't make you like christ has got to be pitched in the garbage can Amen. it is no good Amen. it is damaging to people and without being indignant and angry, I am up to here with all this froth that does not satisfy the soul of a man. Amen. My soul hungers and thirsts for God, yes. for the living God, as in a dry and a thirsty land where no water is. And when people try and tell me there's water here, I say, no, there isn't. There is no water here, but there's water in here. 
He put it in there by the grace of God. Amen. The outer court of old in the tabernacle of old, which was an image, shadow, of a greater tabernacle, which the Lord pitched not man, had an outer court around the tabernacle. The outer court was uh, roughly 150 by 50 feet. Tabernacle 45 or 15 feet, so there's considerable space between the tabernacle and the uh, curtains of the outer court. In this outer court, there was an altar and there was a labor, but they were preparatory. They were not meant to be the area where you camped. In fact, they were not where the effective ministry was done. A sacrifice had to be made, washing had to be made, but that wasn't the end of the matter. See, we've been lingering at the labor, us restoration folk. Now, you know it's the truth. Someone's got to say it. Since I don't have to worry about a career, I can say it. <laughs> we've been lingering out here in the labor in the outer court. And that was to in, or enable us to get into the inner court where our Lord is. Outer court, religion. You know, in the old tabernacle, the holiest of all, that's where God meant with them. Everything else was just service. We talk a lot about service today. I hear a lot about service and service and service, and that's nice. I'm for service. I really am. I want to serve God. I've given my life to serve God. I will die for God. <coughs> But I want to be in God's presence for a day in his presence is like a thousand. Yeah. <laughs> Just let me spend some time with God and I'll get on with the work. Amen. Gladly and joyfully. In the book of the Revelation, we get some indication about God's view of outer court religion. I'm lingering here because I'm talking about the holiest and we've been, we've been handed out in the world today a religion that does not know anything about the holiest place of all. And there in the 11th chapter of the Revelation, God sent out an angel to measure the city. I said, I want you to measure this tabernacle. That's a place of commerce, the place of religious commerce. I want you to measure it. And I want you to measure the means of appropriation of the altar, measure the altar. And I want you to measure the worshipers. Huh? Me measure the worshipers. Would that be a good sign over the church, you know? Measures, you're being, worse worshipers, you're being measured today. But in Revelation 11, 2, as the angel begins to take his measurement rod and begin to measure the city, a voice thunders out from the throne. And it says, measure not the outer court. Don't measure it. Leave it out. It's been given to the Gentiles. When that got through to me, I quit measuring the outer court. Do you realize? Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I've got better things to say than this. But do you realize that all church squabbles, all arguments about unity, all arguments about theology doesn't make any difference what they are or who says them. They're all done in the outer court. They're all in the outer court. And God says it's not even worth measuring. That's what he said. This is in the word. Don't major that outer court. Get out of that outer court. Get the altar. Get the sacrifice. Get the cleansing. And get into the holiest of all. Because that's what it's all about. Amen. I like this word that Paul told Timothy. It must have been hard for him. He said, now, there are some that have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. Timothy said, well, what are we going to do about them? He says, turn away. That's what he said. Turn away. And I figure... We can give them a little chance. Paul gave the Jews three Sabbaths to shape up. After three Sabbaths, he said, you judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, we're going to the Gentiles. That'd be like one of us saying, we're going to the Baptists. <laughs> Come on, this is what it sounded like to them, folk. Yeah. And you remember there come a time when God gave up on that early world. He said, the flood, he sent the flood. He said, that's it. That's it. Sodom and Gomorrah, the time run out. Canaanites, the time run out. Hittites, the time run out. Even old Nineveh, after it was spared worse, the time run out. Tyre and Sidon, the time run out. And Jesus Christ, the meek and lowly Jesus, whom Paul said, I beseech you by the gentleness and meekness of Christ, he said to Jerusalem, your house is left desolate. 
because you didn't know the day of your visitation. I'm telling you, folk, the church today is about to be left desolate because it's not spending time in the holiest, wandering and meandering around in the outer court. Now, why do we approach God? Why? Jesus died to bring us to God. Romans 7, 4 says that we died so we could bring forth fruit to God. We've been reconciled to God. It's the Spirit of God. It's the Son of God. It's the grace of God, the love of God, the peace of God. See, it's from God. We've been brought back to God. Thank God we have. Amen. It's good to be with him. Now, our text says that we've been entered, we enter now into the holiest place. There is a place most holy, a place more holy than any other place. It is in the kingdom of God. It is the only acceptable place. Now, in the world, something that's most or more or best, not everybody can have it. Just a choice few can. But in the kingdom, the most, the best, the more is the only thing. God has to offer. He doesn't have anything else to offer. <clears throat> See, we've been trans delivered from the power of darkness. The power of darkness. Is that a good concept? We've been delivered from the power of darkness. So don't think you have to sin. Don't think you can't say no to the devil. You've been delivered from the power of darkness. Don't think you have to say, stay ignorant. You do not. Don't think that you have to have blinders on when you read the scripture. You do not. You do not have to be powerless and weak and ignorant and unlearned. You do not. You've been delivered from the power of darkness, and Satan cannot contend with no. That's all Jesus told him, you know, and he was tempted. He said, no. Buttressed it with some of the word of God. Even when Satan quoted some scripture back, he just said no. No. We've been delivered from the power of darkness and translated into the kingdom of God's dear son. I like that. Well, you're dear too because you're in Christ. In fact, when God looks at Jesus, he thinks about you. And when he looks at you, he thinks about Jesus. You've been joined to him. We've been raised to occupy heavenly places. They're better. They're better. Now, this, this shouldn't surprise anyone. We read in the scripture about things that are greater and better and more. We read about greater riches, greater joy, greater glory. And this is all in the scripture. We read about better things, better hope, better covenant, better sacrifice, better high priest, better country. See, this is a concept in Scripture. We read about best gifts. We read about more glory, more grace, more abounding love. We read about more needful things and more abundant things. See, it's all in Scripture. Concept is there. So people who say every day is alike, everything's alike, see, they're wrong. Amen. They're just wrong. There's a place that's closer than any other place. There's a place that's better than any other place. There's a place where you're stronger, more confident than any other place. Every place is not the same. When you are with God, you can survive Gethsemane. Amen. And when you are not with God, you cannot survive a campfire. Amen. Ask Peter, he will tell you. <laughs> the holiest of all. See, the thrust carries us behind the, beyond the ordinary and it forbids the mediocre. Amen. Now we have allowed Satan to bring mediocrity. The menace of mediocrity has flooded us, but God will have nothing to do with it. Amen. He will spew those that are lukewarm out of his mouth. Make no mistake about it. Amen. Jesus embalmed it in print so people knew how he felt about it. Amen. And yet it is tolerated. Huh? All over it is tolerated. In fact, if you see someone zealous, you better not have them go to church. The church may put it out. It's a serious condition is Amen. what I'm saying. It's an infinitely more serious condition than people think. Yeah. We can have conventions and pump people up and get our professional singing groups on and our psychological gurus and we can bring them in and have them give us all the answers. But when all is said and done, if Jesus can't build you up, you are dead. Yeah. And nothing else will do it. Yeah. But I'm here to tell you that Jesus can build you up. And if you will get close to him, 
he will ignite your spirit. Amen. And if you come into the holiest place of all, it will not be long till you will say, here am I, send me. Yeah. Amen. And you will not stay there defiled either. Amen. Not in the holy place of all. Amen. The most holy. <clears throat> At some point, you see, you must leave the ordinary, the common, and the customary. You've got to leave it at some point. Yeah. Because to get in the holiest, you've got to get out of the ordinary. Yeah. The outer courts, you've got to get out of it. You've even got to get out of the holy place. You've got to get out of all of that into the presence of God where you are welcomed in Christ Jesus. Amen. Yeah. God will welcome you like the Father welcomed the prodigal son. In fact, even more than that, Christ has received us to the glory of God, the scripture Amen. says. What a glorious truth. It says that we have confidence to enter into the holiest place. You see, you cannot draw close to God without some degree of confidence. There's no amount of work you can do, no amount of, if you if you cry out loud. Or you, or you weep a lot, or you work hard, that's not what gives you the confidence. Your confidence comes from the fact that you know that you have been made worthy in Christ. Amen. That Christ has satisfied God on your, on your behalf Amen. and your account. Amen. I think I've shared this with you before, but it means a lot to me, so I'll share it with you again. Back when I used to work for money, I used to put aside some money every month for my children. And that was a bank account for them. And I would, uh, was explaining one time to Ada here what impute meant. She was wondering about that word impute. And I said, you know, we have this bank account, your name is on it. And when you come of age, you, you can spend that money. That's yours, however you want to spend it. But listen, Ada, you did not make the money I made the money, I earned the money, and I imputed it to your account. Now, folks, Jesus made us accepted. Jesus paid our debt. Jesus is bringing us to God, but you can spend it Amen. and use it Amen. for God's glory. You can come boldly or confidently is the idea. We have, Ephesians 3.12 says, we have access with confidence oh, yeah. into this grace wherein we stand. <laughs> we stand in it. Romans says, we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. What a, what a marvelous thought. Yeah. Having boldness. Having boldness. Not getting boldness. Oh. Having boldness. If you can see it, your faith has a quality of boldness about it. Yeah. Faith has a confident aspect to it. If you will live by faith, that is a quality of faith. Confidence is a quality of faith. Yes. You see it all through scriptures. You see this woman with an issue of blood for 12 years. Her issue of blood started the same time Jairus' daughter was born. Have you ever thought about that? And as Jesus was coming by, she decided she was going to make her way through to Jesus. And she went. It was a big crowd. It wasn't like our times. And she pressed through this crowd. And she made, now she was weak. She was worse. She spent all her living on the physician. There was so much the better, but so much the worse, the scripture says. But she made it to Jesus. How did she do it? Jesus brought her there. Amen. If you will get up and come to him, he will make sure you get there. Amen. I tell you, when I saw this, I repented that I had lagged so long, Amen. lacking confidence for pressing into the presence of God. All God wants is your will on this. I want you. I gave my son for you. I paved the way here for you. It's a sanctified way. It's a holy way. He's perfected it. If you can get on the road, it leads there. Just stay on the road, and he'll bring you safely through. Boldness. Boldness also has the idea of expectancy. We come in, we expect <laughs> to receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. I think of the time that our Lord said to his heavenly Father, I thank you, O God, that you have heard me. <laughs> and you can emulate that too. 
in your own measure. I thank you, O oh God, that you have heard me. And that kind of builds confidence and expectancy. So you, I admonish you to pick out something you would like to take into the holiest of all. And bring it, oh, it must be something challenging. Amen, yes. Our God is, uh, now his arm's not short. Amen. Uh, he's able to save to the uttermost. He is not restrained with many or few. There's no restraint with him. Amen. And you take some challenging case how, and build one another up to do this. Help one another to do this. To come in boldly to the throne of grace. What does it mean to enter into the holy? Like, what does that mean? It means that the Lord dominates your heart and your mind. It means that lesser interests are subjugated. That suddenly what's going on in the world like who cares? Amen. I can tell you that when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, if one of the disciples had rushed up and said, Hey, there's been a new tax bill passed. What do you think about that? He would have said, What am I to do with that? There are times when even legitimate interests become illegitimate. Yes. And it is so when you're in the holiest. But let me tell you, some people think, well, then that means you don't have an interest in anything in the world. No, not so. When you come out from the holiest, you're able to do something yes. about those things. Amen. And to be a minister for good Amen. instead of a griper for bad. <laughs> Entering into the presence of the Lord. You enter with a true heart, unvarnished, open, and have a purged conscience. Well, I will be the first to tell you that my own sins bother me. They do. Every once in a while, I think back, time I lost. And who knows, who knows what the effects of that was. But then I think what, what God does it remember them. And in that strength, I will come into his presence. Lord, I'm having trouble with my sin. I thank you that you're not. Amen. Help me to have your mind on the matter. Amen. See, life is not always easy. Some of you know that when we moved to Joplin, we encountered some new challenges in our life. Our son had cancer. There's little Benjamin over there. Cancer free tonight. But he wasn't for a long time. And then just a few months ago, we received word that my youngest daughter from my first wife, who passed away, is dying of Lou Gehrig's disease. And do you think these things are easy? Indeed, they are not. But faith makes us equal to them. Amen. And I ask the Lord, when I cry, help me cry at night. But when I'm with my brethren, help me anoint my head and be a testimony to the grace of God and the power of God. When you come into the holiest, you can lose those closest to you and you can shout with joy and with confidence, the Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. That's in the holiest. You talk like that. We have a veil, an anchor that's within the veil. Our, our, our anchor is cast upward instead of downward. <laughs> so when you, when you cast your veil upward, that's another way of saying you know you're going to heaven. And you know you're going to heaven. It's just a matter of time. It's not if you're going to die. It's when you're going to die. And you know you're going there. It stabilizes you. And when the winds blow, and they will, yeah. believe me, if they haven't, they will. And when the winds blow, you can hold and say, my anchor's firm. Yeah, Since last we met, I had meant to, tell, to say this, but... I feel a little melancholy, so I'll share this with you. Since our last renewal, of course, my mother went to be with the Lord after four years of illness. It has been, in a way, a year of new, new challenges for us. But see, I have to tell you these things. You would never have known this if I didn't tell you, because the smell of smoke's not on my clothes. When she passed, uh, passed away to be with the Lord, it's actually is a, a bit of prose, but I will tell you, part of what it said because it ministered so, so to me she was like a ship that was sailing to the other side there we stood on the shore you know watching the snail 
get smaller, smaller, finally disappeared over the horizon. Someone said, she's gone. <laughs> but on the other side, they said, here she comes. <laughs> That's how you can enter with confidence. Amen. Because you can go down to the lowest hour and still have hope. Amen. Someday they'll welcome us on the other side. Hallelujah too. We enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. By the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus denotes life poured out as an offering to God. As has been said, it's not... <laughs> It involves chemical substance, but it's more than chemical substance. <coughs> blood stands for the individual, the individual himself, with his life and with his value and with his worth. See, Acts 17, 26 says, Of one blood made he all nations of men for to dwell upon the face of the earth. That one blood was Adam. See, the blood was a person. <coughs> And you know the Leviticus definition, of course, that the life of the flesh is in the blood. The blood of Christ stands for the willing forfeiture of his life for humanity. I enter by that. If Jesus did that, don't think it was easy. I think we've oversimplified this, this incarnation. That's the trouble with systematized theology. It desensitizes the truth. And suddenly it's lost its power. It's just as a creed. We stand boldly for it, but we're not changed by it. All that was involved in Jesus humbling himself, laying his deity in escrow, if you please. Because when Jesus was born... And there he was, a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. He was not omnipotent. He was not omniscient. He was not omnipresent. He was totally helpless. And God had to tell Joseph to take care of him. That's part of blood. See, that's part of the blood. It's his life. Everything that went along with him becoming humanity so that he might save us. That offering was offered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. You'll remember. Now the word of God tells us, Brother Dave mentioned this text in Revelation 5, 6. He said, I saw a lamb as it had been slain. The idea there is of, of a newly slain lamb. There is too much talk today about 2,000 years ago. I don't like this. Well, I'm not going to fuss about it or anything like that. But when we talk about Jesus being a lamb newly slain, it means God cannot think of Jesus without thinking of his death, and neither can I. Amen. When I look at Christ, I think there's the one that expiated my sins by forfeiting his life. He poured out his soul in offering for sin. Amen. See, Amen. we have been adversely affected by a religion that surrounds us with people that can't muster up enough courage to come two times a day to church. And so it's dulled people's sensitivities about sacrifice. Yes. But let me tell you, when Jesus gave, he gave all he had to give, and he did, took effort. In fact, an angel was sent from God to strengthen him as he did it. He says, though God said, let's don't, let's, we can't afford this enterprise to go down. I want humanity back. Angel, go down, strengthen him. <laughs> don't think that the devil wasn't tempting him. Perhaps the old servant was saying something like, oh, Jesus, I didn't go. You know, people aren't going to appreciate it. Why, why go through with it? Your own church, <laughs> your own church is just going to forget you. So I think the angel, I don't know how he strengthened him. I can just use a little bit of sanctified imagination. Saying, uh, don't forget the joy set before you. Huh? Remember that promise? I'll give you the heathen for your inheritance. Amen. The church is worth it. Amen. The redeemed people are worth it. When you hear them left their praises to God, it will be worth it. 
When the incense is offered and the prayers of the saints circle up, saying, Abba, Father, it'll be worth it. Go through, and Jesus went through with it. His blood, it's by his blood, the offering of that life. And all that attend to that sacrifice. See, this is vicarious sacrifice. Now, Brother Strauss mentioned this too. There's not a lot of talk today about vicarious sacrifice. In fact, a lot of people never heard the word. I talked to some of the students. I said, you ever heard of vicarious sacrifice? And they say, huh. They have no idea. Substitutionary sacrifice. What we're talking about. One person dies for another. Now, this was developed by God under the law. He wanted to make sure the law was his schoolmaster. This is, this is his dictionary and his encyclopedia. He taught people how to think the way he wanted them to think. One life could be given for another. Now, you remember under the law, it said an eye for eye, tooth for tooth, life for life, stripe for stripe, wound for wound. That's at Exodus 21. That's, that's still the way God operates. God operates like that. Life for life. That's what Jesus did. He gave life for life. Well, when we talk about this, it's necessary to mention innocent blood. Innocent blood. You remember when Jesus was betrayed by Judas, Judas said in Matthew 27, 4, he said, I have betrayed the innocent blood. Now there's considerable in Scripture about innocent blood and about how serious it is to shed it. Manasseh, for instance, the son of Manasseh in 2 Kings 21, that he shed much innocent blood. Very serious matter. And in Psalm 106, Israel is indicted because it formed a league with an alliance with heathen nations and shed much innocent blood. And Proverbs 6, 17 says, God hates hands that shed innocent blood. And in Joel 3.19, Egypt and Edom were brought down by divine judgment because they shed innocent blood. And if you're talking about Cain killing Abel, there was a curse related with it. Or about uh, Ahab and Jezebel killing Naboth, there was a curse associated with it. Or David having Uriah kill the curse associated with it. Whenever innocent blood was shed, there was a curse. A curse. But when Jesus' blood was shed... There was a blessing. Amen. It contradicted everything that went before. God was sensitizing the human spirit. Yes. Telling it, listen, there is such a thing as innocent blood. There is such a thing as people that don't deserve to die. And when I appoint one to die for you, I do it because I recognize it. And if you recognize it, I will call you righteous. Amen. And God doesn't lie. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. He sure does. By curious sacrifice, our debt was legitimately paid. He redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us. That's substitutionary or vicarious. It's like Paul said to Philemon about Onesimus, his runaway slave. He sent him back. He said, if he owes thee aught, lay that to my account. That's what Jesus said. If they owe you anything, Father, Put it on my account. Do that. How often this is found in Scripture. He was made a curse for us. He was made sin for us. He laid the iniquities of us all upon him. He bore our griefs. He carried our sorrows. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. By his stripes we are healed. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquities of us all. And for the transgression of my people was he stricken. Substitutionary. Vicarious. Amen. But we enter by that blood. Amen. Not by routine. In the end, now we enter into the holiest by faith. You all understand that, I'm sure. We enter by faith, but... <laughs> There has come any day when we will enter fully Amen. into the holiest yes. and God himself shall be with us. Amen. That's going to be the culmination of it all. We shall forever be with the Lord. That's why God made us. 
He said, we know that if the earthly house of this tabernacle be destroyed, we have a building of God eternal made in the heavens. He goes on to say, he that hath wrought us for the self-same thing as God. He made us for there, not for here. Amen. So when he calls upon you to enter into the holiest, he's asking you to become oriented to where you're going to spend eternity. Amen. Do it. Faith readies you for that transition. In closing, I would remind you of our father Abraham, who so appropriately pictures the vicarious sacrifice, what happens? You all remember that he went up to offer his only son Isaac upon a mountain that God said he would tell him of. As he journeyed to the mountain, scriptures do not go into how Abraham felt because uh, that would have had a sentimental appeal. When they got to the foot of the mount, Abraham said to the servants, you wait here. I and the lad are going to go and worship and come again. <laughs> now, folk, it was different coming back down the hill than it was going up the hill. Amen. Going up the hill, Isaac said, Father, got the fire here. We got the wood. Where's the sacrifice? Where's the lamb? Abraham, by faith. See, God hadn't told him he was going to provide a lamb at all. By faith, he said, God will provide himself a lamb. You remember the event? He bound his son and laid him on the altar, raised the knife to kill him. The angel of God spoke out to him and called his name two times, Abraham, Abraham. Now I know. Oh, God knew. This is an angel talk. Now I know. There's a ram hung in a thicket. Genesis 22, 13 says, And Abraham offered the ram instead of his son. God offered Jesus instead of you. And it flung the door of heaven wide open. Amen. Whosoever will may come. If you've been dragging around on the bottom of life, I'm not going to beat you on the head for doing it. You've already been beat on the head enough. I'm telling you, get up from there yeah. and come to Amen. God. Amen. If there was every time in all your life when you were closer to God than you are now. You backslid. Now get up and come back into the holiest and he'll restore the years of locusts at Eden. Yes. And it won't be long your ankle bones Amen. will receive strength. Amen. And you'll be able to leap and shout Amen. for joy. Brethren, having bonus, let us come into the holiest of all through a new and a living, living way. I'd like us to sing a closing song together here. Number 259. With the spirit and with the understanding, you want to sing this. Have you been to Jesus? Have you? Yes. 